mas Before you settle into this today, and I got a good one for you, I want you to take some time and subscribe to the channel. I also want you to take some time and share it so you don't forget to share it at the end of it. I want you to also take some time and like it. And finally, I'd like to get feedback from you. So go to the comment section and comment. But today we have a very special one for you. On one hand, we're talking about the 1966 January coup and trying to clarify that that coup was planned and carried out by Nigerian army officers from all the different tribes in Nigeria. And also we want to address being Igbo in Nigeria and all the different parts of Igbo that are denying that they are not Igbos. It's going to be a good one. Now listen to Byron Allen, an Afri African American movie producer. Listen to him talk about the truth and if people are going to live together, why it's essential that we have to tell the truth. Our greatest weapon is the truth. If we bring the truth, we will always win. So tonight, let's talk about the truth. Hello everybody. Once again, this is Fred Monko coming to you from our studios in Chicago with another edition of Bold Talk on Allen TV. And as usual, I like to say good morning Good afternoon and good evening to you, depending on where you are around the world. As I record this, Nigerian history is under attack. Nigeria's bigots and Nigeria's cabal have been debating covertly, not openly, which Nigerian history to teach. There's only one Nigerian history, and it is the truth. Igbos in Nigeria have been under attack since 1967. The cabal that leads Nigeria, now aided by the Tinubu administration, 
are trying to hide the history of Nigeria and how Igbo contributions to this country should be presented. I don't think there is a better way to present how they would like to distort the story of Igbos in Nigeria than to introduce you to what Byron Allen said about what America is doing to African Americans. They are downplaying our contributions to this beautiful country and changing our narrative and diminishing our images. Unfortunately, we have seen this before. You erase the truth so you can repeat the atrocities again. That is so relative to what's going on in Nigeria today. All you need to do is relate what Byron Allen said there to what happened in 1966 and through the end of the war. And now that Igbos are starting to reassert themselves in the country to do what they do best, the paranoia started again. And look at what Bola Ahmed Tinubu and Governor Songolu did in Lagos during the elections to stop Igbos from voting. We must tell our own stories, keep control of the narrative, and our images. Representation matters. Representation does matter. I may not be building one of the world's biggest media groups, but I can assure you one thing, I'm building one of Nigeria's biggest social media groups that is dedicated to telling the truth. The bigots are angry because they're like, why is he always saying that? I'm always saying it. Because the Bayo Nonugas and the Dele Alakes and the Cabal and all their news distortion journalists in Nigeria have distorted the news so much that the only way we can catch up is that I, I have to keep pumping it and pumping it until the young Nigerians, not the bigots, the progressives, start to really think about what I'm saying and going to read for themselves what the true stories are. Here is one we could start with. The 1966 January coup in Nigeria was not spearheaded by Igbos. The 1966 coup was planned in collaboration with Igbos, Yorubas, Fulanis, and other people. Igbos just happened to be the highest ranking army officers. And to that effect, an Igbo army officer had to take charge. <laughs> During the January 15, 1966 military coup led by some young idealistic officers. And let me very quickly correct one historical profanity. One historical profanity. Because by the grace of God, I'm not just a lawyer. I'm an historian and an archivist. And things must be put in historical perspective. Whenever I hear people say, the 1966 coup was led, was an Igbo coup. It is a lie from the pit of hell. It is not true. It was a coup led by dissatisfied, disgruntled Nigerians. There were 21 people in all, with the forefront leader being Major Kaduna Uzogu Chukuma from Okpanam near Asaba in the present day state. Therefore, let me tell you that others who have always made them to say it was an Igbo coup were Major Emmanuel Ifeajuna, Major Chris Anuforo, Major Timothy Onwatuego, Major Humphrey Chukuka, Major Don Okafo, Captain Ben Bully, Captain Emmanuel Mobushi and Captain Ogbu Oji. These were the seven Igbos. But now, let us look at the list of the coup players. We have Major Adewale Ademoyegun. He was Yoruba. He's the one who authored the book, Why We Struck. We had Captain G. Adeleke. 
this was Yoruba. We had Captain Fola Oyewole. He was Yoruba. We, who authored the book, The Reluctant Rebel. We had Lieutenant Aru Egbiko. He was Asian from our own Edo state. We had Lieutenant Tijani Kasina. He was Hausa Fulani. We had Lieutenant O. Olafe Mio, Yoruba. We had Captain Gipsy Jalo. He was of the Middle Belt. We had Lieutenant Pope Harris Egaga. He was an Yoruba man. We had Lieutenant Dag Waribori. He was an German. We had Second Lieutenant Saleh Dambo. He was Hausa. And we had finally Second Lieutenant John Atom. Bera. Many of you knew him as a military administrator. He was of TV, TV extraction. Why am I doing this? It's simple. The lies that this cabal has told Nigerians since 1967 need to be corrected. Those lies are the worst lies against humanity in Nigeria. Somebody has to do it. I'm not doing this to be popular but I'm doing this to stand on the right side of history. And let me play you more of Byron Scott, related to African-Americans, but in a way that it applies to Nigeria, and especially Nigeria today. You're killing us in the courtroom by making sure we do not have equal justice. You're killing us in the boardroom by making sure that we do not get real economic inclusion. And you're killing us in the hospital room by making sure that we do not have proper health care. And you're doing all of this long before you kill us in the streets. So I'm asking America to understand, appreciate, and accept the truth that the black community is one of America's greatest assets and not a liability. Byron Allen just keeps saying it for us. He's talking about atrocities against black Americans in America. I'm talking about atrocities in Nigeria. Yes, against Igbos, but realistically against Nigeria's progressives. Whether they are Yoruba or Fulani or Hausa or Edo, the atrocities that the Fulani cabal and this Tinubu cabal are committing is exactly what America has done to African Americans for centuries. And let me add that progressive Nigerians across the board, and Igbos in particular, are one of Nigeria's greatest assets and not a liability. And until this group, the progressives across the country and the Igbos are included in the boardrooms and every other place you need representation, Nigeria is not going to find peace. And as long as you force Igbos and their commerce to come to Lagos to clear their goods, you are not going to find peace in Lagos because Lagosians are going to keep complaining that Igbos are taking over. If you don't want us to take over, be fair and equitable in resource distribution. And until the seaports in Calabar and Port Harcourt and Wari and all those places are dredged, Nigeria is not going to find peace. And this now brings me to the other side of this discussion which is who is Igbo in Nigeria and who is not Igbo. It doesn't matter who is Igbo, it doesn't matter who is not Igbo, but politically and for the strength of Igbos, just like Yorubas have their strength, Hausas have their strength, and Fulanis have their strength, Edo, Ibibi, everybody have their strength. Igbos need to know who is Igbo in Nigeria. And in 1967, it was expedient for General Gowan and his Fulani cabal to create states 
even though the states were created all across the country, but the biggest hurry in creating those states was to break up Igbos in eastern Nigeria. Go to River State and tell Iquerez that they are part of Nigeria. Nigeria will take care of them. Igbos are suppressing them. Go to the Midwest and tell the Igbos in the Midwest that Igbos are suppre suppressing them. Before the war, we were all Igbos. So if before the war, we were all Igbos, what really happened? If somebody from Ibuzo and somebody from Ogwashuku and somebody from Oseluku and Onichubo and all those places, and Abo of all places, if all those people were Igbos before the war, how come all of a sudden after the war they are not Igbos? That's one part. The second part is as an Igbo person, I'm not desperate for anybody to be Igbo. But I'm very curious if your name is Igbo and every explanation of your name is Igbo and you pump out your chest and say, oh, we are not Igbo because you went to Lagos during the war, learned how to speak Yoruba, had your kids in Yoruba, they all speak in Lagos and they all speak Yoruba and all of a sudden you are not Igbo. Aren't you a disgrace to yourself? Do you really think Yorubas think you're Yoruba? If Yorubas don't think you're Yoruba and you say you are not Igbo, aren't you confused and contradicted and probably sick in your head? Then in Ikwere, everything was fine before the war. There was a place called Omomasi that I remember clearly, but there are a lot of other places with Igbo names. And after the war, you started adding R in front of the name. So Omomasi became Rumomasi. My name is Nwankwo. If I convert my name, if I add S-K-Y to the end of my name, does it make me Polish? by saying that my name is Juan Kwoski, so I'm not Igbo, I'm Polish. It's asinine. But let's even leave the ones outside the borders of the five core Igbo states. Let's come into Igbo land. I have a lot of friends in Onitsha, great friends, great people. But I always hear this story about we are from Benin and we are from Ife. My hometown is Ajale in Anambra State, which is actually Ojari in Anambra State. A village in Arochuku called Ojari Village is where people from Ojari migrated to Anambra State from and settled in a community called Ojari in Anambra State, which is now called Ajale. But even beyond that, half of the town has no ties to Aro. But because Aro settled there, the whole town is seen as an Aro community. My mother's family is from Aro Chukwu originally. My father's family is not from Aro. I take pride in saying I'm from Aro as the origin of our town. But I'm an Anambra man, thick and thin. If I go to Nigeria to run for office, I'm not going to run for office in Abia. I'm going to run for office in Anambra State. And nobody in Anambra would deny me if I'm qualified. So the same thing applies to our nature people. When somehow, for some reason, your forefathers went off to Ife and Benin, and ultimately some came back and crossed the Niger and settled in Onitsha. And there's this pride about we're from Benin or we have roots in Ife. It really makes me wonder 
The reason it makes me wonder is I want to read out some names to you. Nam de Azikiwe. And this this list is not all inclusive. There's way more. Odumewojuku, Emeka Odumewojuku's father, who was the first millionaire in Nigeria. Alex Ekweme, Emai Okbara, Chinua Achebe, Samon Bakwe, Sipre Nekwensi, Chima Amanda Adichie, Ngozi Okojiwala, Akanu Ibiam, K.O. Mbadiwe, Mbono Ojike, Jaja Wachuku, Philip Emma Wally, who is a foremost computer scientist across the world. Do any of those names take a second place in Nigeria to a Wolowo or any other big name in Yoruba land? Let me make myself clear. Awolowo is a great name, but I'm not a Yoruba person. I admire Awolowo for his position in Nigeria, but I'm an Igbo man. Do I feel less Nigerian because I'm not affiliated to Awolowo? Does Azikiwe take a second place to Awolowo? So what's this big deal about we're from Benin and we're from... Great, don't get me wrong, but do you really have ancestral blood ties to Benin? And if you do, how come your names are Igbo names and not Benin names or Ife names? And then it takes me to a Bonnie state where at least today we know that Akanwe Biam is from Ebony. But in recent times, the biggest name out of Ebony in recent times is David Umahi. And he proudly goes on national TV to say that if Nigeria is breaking up and Igbos are breaking into their own country, Ebony is not going to be part of the Igbo state. Umahi is that a, an Aosa name? The reason I bring these things up is that the Fulani Cabal in 1967 went on a mission to put a knife to the things that held the both together. We call ourselves educated people. If we know that that's what's going on, why do we divide ourselves up instead of doing what it takes to unite, regardless of what part of the country they place us, whether they place us in rivers, the Ukwere people, you are Igbos. It doesn't matter. They can put you wherever you want. The Yorubas and Kwaras don't say they are houses. The Yorubas in Kogi State don't say they are houses. The Yorubas who return to Nigeria from Brazil don't say they are Brazilians. It's shameful to me that Igbos who were the foremost group in Nigeria before the war, and any Nigerian who is fair and open-minded knows that there is a covert unwritten policy to minimize Igbos. It's shameful to me that Igbos themselves play into those gimmicks. It's very disappointing. But to buttress what I'm saying, let me play you what an Igbo person from Delta said about that situation. Because me saying it as a non-Deltan or as a non-Onicha or as a non equerry sounds like if I have an agenda. Let me have you hear it from the mouth of somebody who is not from the Koi Igbo states. After making the video to prove that Okpobo are Igbo community, even though they are claiming to be Ijo, 
some people started arguing with me that i'm you know i don't have much evidence to prove it no i don't need evidence truth sometimes does not have evidence it's logic it's common sense when you hear it you know that this is the truth there are so many reasons why so many of these people are denying that they are not Igbos. Whether it's Ikwere, even some of my people, like the Ndokwa people in my place. Oil was discovered in the so-called Niger Delta before the Civil War. It was the oil, the crude oil discovered, that made people like Azikboro to form what they call Niger Delta. And that was the first people that cut out from Nigeria and fought a civil war that lasted 12 days before the Brafran War. However, most of them now, pride cannot let them accept that they are Igbo because the major reason why they deny Igbo before even the Civil War, most of them are not enjoying the benefits. Tell me an Igbo community or these so-called Igbos who are denied they are not Igbo communities that are living better than the Igbo communities. Everybody is suffering it. Nigerian government has equally treated you the way they will treat Igbos. Your communities, your villages are not developed. <laughs> and pride will not let you say Abibo because it's in Ibibo now. If you talk I'm Ibo people say, hey, she be don't do Shanga, I confess your dollar. Now the truth, the truth of the matter is this. As I'm talking to you now, there are a professor that's trying to rewrite the history of Undoki people. And he's trying to even to change the man who find Ndoki, which is the Okpara Ndoli. Now there's a major history that the Ndoli people believed, or what they call it, Ubani, believed that that is how their, their, their ancestors found their place. Which is the, the same story like with the Anyoma, the Onecha, Ado Nidu, the, 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 the Kaz, and other Ikwere's, other part of people that are claiming that are not Igbo. The war between Oba and uh, Idu in Bini Kingdom, which caused the migration of our people returning back to Anyoma and even the Onicha returning back to Yoshimili and the Kwerez. That is the main story. When there's a war in Sudan, what happens? Nigerians return back to Nigeria. When there's a xenophobia in South Africa, Nigerians return back to Nigeria. When there's a crisis in the north, the Igbos return back home. What does that tell you? That when there's a war in where you sojourn, where comes to your mind? Where do you find comfort? Home. This will tell you that both the Ndoki, the Okpobo, the Ikweres, even the we, the Anyomas, that are claiming that uh, we migrated during the war is because we are going back home. Yes, that's what it means. Home is where you find comfort. That's why most of why, when you left Benin, when you left Benin according to that history, why didn't you face to west and enter Ilefe? Why do you run back to east? When you come back, why didn't you face Eastern Road so that you meet the Igbira people? Maybe from there you meet Gwari and, and, uh, and Gwagi people. Why do you face east? Because you are going back home showing that you are an Igbo man. But again, common sense is not common. It's common. Everybody will have it. You want to be denied that you are not Igbo. Let me tell you, even if you claim that you are not Igbo, how can you be running towards the east? And the Igbos that are running, knowing that the Idu, there's a war in Idu killing their own people, will not kill you if you are a truly Benin man. If they find there's a Benin man running towards his, why wouldn't they kill you in those days? Say, ah, this is part of them that are killing our people in Do. Wouldn't they kill you? But the Igbos accepted you, even if you are Benin. I'm telling you now, if you accept that you are Benin, when you are running out of Benin and running to save land, they accepted you. Treat you well. Gave you land and you are still sabotaging them. Let's assume you are Benin when you left Idu. Let's assume that you are you are you are you are Benin. Your, fa your forefathers are Benin when they left Idu and they are running towards the east. Why wouldn't they kill them? But they didn't kill them. They welcome them, give them land. They settle. You start backbiting them. You start hate hating them. You start speaking against them. You start denying them. If your people they kill you, you run away from there according to your story.
Now Arab people will accept you. Assume you know because we know you are already Igbo. You are just denying it. But I'm saying assuming that your forefathers are not Igbo through to their Benin, why wouldn't they kill them? If they did not kill them and accept them, is it not for you to pay them back by accepting that you are Igbo? While you are speaking the language, bearing the name, doing their culture? I'm out of here, Joe. I guess I rest my case right there. He's out of here, Joe. I'll be out of here in a minute too. But I hope you understood what I was trying to present there. We have to present our history correctly. Let the chips fall where they may, but let them be truthful. And until we start telling ourselves the truth in Nigeria, we're wasting our time and prolonging the day that we're going to be able to say in honesty, fellow countrymen and women, because right now we are not fellow country men and women. We are just a bunch of different tribes fooling ourselves to milk whatever we can milk out of Nigeria. And the ones I really feel sorry for in that aspect are people from the Delta State and River State and Aquaibom, where they all really come from. Everybody shares in the revenue. It's our revenue. But when it comes to the selfish interests, we forget that most of the money that we've used to develop different parts of the country, Lagos, Kaduna, Kano, and all that, all that money came from River State and Aquaibom and Delta State. And, and for the most part, those are the states, especially River State, that are most devastated by environmental issues. This is simply food for thought. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, this is Fred Wankwa coming to you from our studios in Chicago with another edition of Bull Talk on LN TV. And until next time, good night and God bless. Yo, 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 yo,